This week, the encrypted economy had Dr. Thomas Harjano on the podcast. I probably could have done a few different podcasts with Dr. Harjano. I was drawn to his current paper on DLT gateways and thus this podcast. I've been reading a lot more papers lately. I hear a lot about TLDR, but generally I am a TSDU or too short, didn't understand category. Anyway, Dr. Harjono was a driving force for years behind the MIT Kerberos Consortium, which is probably the most ubiquitously deployed symmetric authentication protocol worldwide. He was an engineer at Bay Networks, a principal scientist at Verisci and PKI, and in a number of startups as well. He's an authority on identity, data privacy, trust, applied cryptography, and cybersecurity. Fundamentally, one of the problems that he is trying to solve for is interoperability between DLT networks, which can be private networks. In his view, the DLT gateway he discusses isn't necessarily competitive with bridging networks like Wanchain. He views standardization of DLT gateways as complementary to bridging networks. In many ways, I could see how this standardization would facilitate more bespoke private DLT network implementations than that could facilitate even creating networks of networks. Gateways can facilitate common standards across multiple protocols and thus achieve interoperability. The gateways themselves are not the cross-chain solution. They need another protocol operating in between the gateway. One of their target use cases is a bold one, facilitating interconnectivity of virtual asset services providers, VASPs, as envisioned by the Financial Action Task Force. In that context, one acronym that pops up is TRISA, T-R-I-S-A, or the Travel Rule Information Sharing Alliance, which he speaks about on this podcast. There is also an interesting sidebar in here related to the architectural decisions underpinning the development of Web 2.0 and decisions that steered it away from more of a Web 3.0 implementation. There's a few acronyms I want to touch on before we get into the podcast because they pop up a lot. One is ODAP. This refers to an open digital asset protocol, which is a protocol that can operate between two gateway devices that Dr. Harjono was involved in creating. But it isn't the only protocol that can operate between gateways. Another one is IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is a large open international community of network designers, operators, vendors, and researchers focused on the evolution of internet architecture and the smooth operation of the internet. His paper has been submitted for publication as a standard of the IETF, which means that it would have completed a rigorous review process designed to identify any open engineering issues. So with that drop, I bring you this week's episode with Thomas Harjono. Also, if you like this podcast, or you think you know others that would like it, please share it. Welcome to The Encrypted Economy, a weekly podcast featuring discussions exploring the business, laws, regulation, security, and technologies relating to digital assets and data. I am Eric Hess, founder of Hess Legal Counsel. I've spent decades representing regulated exchanges, broker-dealers, investment advisors, and all matter of fintech companies for all things touching electronic trading, with a focus on new and developing technologies. So we're with Dr. Thomas Harjono, currently the CTO of Connection Science and Technical Director of the MIT Trust Data Consortium. Welcome, Dr. Harjano. Uh, Thank you, Eric. So uh, before we get into the podcast, maybe give us a little bit about your background and um, what brought you to looking at, uh, I guess, gateway mechanisms for public blockchain and blockchain generally. Uh, Great. Uh, Thank you, uh, Eric, again, for having me on this podcast. So um, I guess I am a child of the early 90s and um, grew up through this whole uh, internet revolution when when TCP IP was not yet TCP IP and when the IP packet data structures were still not finalized. And, um, you know, so so this is this is I see parallels in today's world of, of blockchains and crypto and so on. And I think this is an exciting time. I'm, you know, I wake up every morning thinking, wow, this is, you know, I'm living this twice over now. This is, this is pretty cool. Uh, so a bit about my background. So uh, in the early 90s, of course, um, you know, uh, a number of companies, startups have, were developing uh, solutions for IP routing. 
And my first early job was, in fact, with a company called Bay Networks, which has now been forgotten. At the time, it was actually larger than Cisco, and you know, it occupied you know sixty percent of the market. And um, in that uh, in that period, my focus has always been security, so IP security. Uh, IP multicast security was a big deal back then. And of course, in those days before the iPod, the first iPod came out, it was all about DRM and DRM, uh, you know, data uh, content protection. And I moved on to the area of um, X509 digital certificates, which is essentially public key, uh, uh, public cryptography. Uh, and uh, that was also deemed to be very crucial technology. And today, with you know, with Bitcoin and so on, suddenly there's a renaissance of interest in uh, cryptography, particularly in public key type, you know, cryptography. Uh, so I spent a few years there, worked for a company called Verisign, and and understood the importance of uh, services that provided public key related, um, you know, functions particularly for certain verticals. So the one I was very familiar with is the cable network industry, because back then kids used to hack the set-top boxes with the goal of getting free movies. And the whole industry essentially moved over two or three years uh, into this um, uh, device certificate model where your you know, set-top box would have a certificate and the, the um, network provider upstream would have the CMTS, CMTS server, which is run by the cable provider would have the same thing and so on. Uh, uh, from there, you know, um, I did a couple of startups, got burned out and ended up at MIT uh, running the Kerberos development team. So Kerberos is an authentication protocol that originated from a 1982, 1984 paper. This is the famous Needham Schroeder uh, protocol. Uh, those are big names for those who study cryptography. That's probably yep. your um, lecture one, week one, you know, symmetric key based authentication, which is kind of interesting because it's not public key based. And so uh, Kerberos was a, a core part of the famous MIT project Athena that included different parts such as the X windows for those who remember X windows. That is the grand granddaddy daddy of what we have today in the computer, which is Windows on on the PC and on the Mac. And at MIT, um, you know, people wanted to share resources such as files and file systems, and there was there was no authentication protocol. There was nothing, and so this project, you know, started way back when. And uh, when I took it over, you know, um, back in what is it now, uh, two thousand seven. You know, we were trying to find a way to move the code forward because what had happened was the code, the actual software had been included, embedded within products such as Active Directory, which is the Microsoft flagship uh, product. And, and therefore, basically any uh, company, any enterprise that runs Microsoft of any version, you know, client and, and server would have our code in there. And so Microsoft has done uh, awesome, beautiful work on top of the Kerberos. It's got, it's got amazing, amazing um, features that we could, we need a special podcast just to talk about the features of, <laughs> of you know, Microsoft Kerberos. And of course, uh, Mac of, you know, um, uh, you know, is on Kerberos as well. So, you know, that was part of, you know, our achievement at MIT was, you know, during this five, six years that I was leading it, we had a whole bunch of uh, companies come and say to us, like, what features do you want, right? So so that was uh, the MIT Kerberos Foundation and the Kerberos protocol development is still running, it's still ongoing. It's it's primarily done through, um, you know, e emails. And, and so, um, uh, I've stayed on at MIT. It's an addictive place, <laughs> as, as you know, Eric. This is so much uh, going on, and um, you know, back in two thousand, I think um, eight or nine, I read this, uh, you know, Nakamoto paper and kind of kind of yawn. Okay, like this is this is beautiful. This is beautiful work. You know, th three different pillars of uh, of design of constructs supporting this currency. But hey, you know, I was. I was around when Digicash. People might remember Digicash with Chow way back, and yep. it, I was excited back then. And it was a, it was. I was disappointed. A okay, a why? why? <laughs> so you're like, I'm not gonna get burned this time, right? Yeah, you know, and like, oh, what happened? Digicash didn't go anywhere, but the credit card industry did. The card payments industry just, you know, blossomed in the last twenty years. 
And so I said, like, okay, yeah, okay, and I, Bitcoins, yeah, that's nice, but like, who would use Bitcoin for goodness? You know, little, little did I know. So you know, I, I paid attention, and of course, think I think for me the 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 real sort of meat of uh, was when um, Ethereum came along with the smart contracts, right? So okay, that, this is a very interesting construction. So we, you know, I've been looking at that. So back to your question about gateways, um, the internet design. Um, of you know of the 80s and 90s also faced the same dilemmas that we had local area networks lands that employed specific not just specific cabling technology but specific packet data packet structure technology and so how do you interconnect these networks and so um, there's a thing called you know border gateways that are used in the internet today so the same architecture uh, you know is kind of uh, you know, we're, we're we're visiting the same architecture for the purposes of of um, blockchain and uh, blockchain network interoperability and, and crypto. And so, <clears throat> moving out of the, I guess you, you know we're we're we've been in sort of the hype cycle stage, which has generated Cypher. a lot of attention onto crypto. But as we start to move out of it, how do you anticipate these lay, uh, layer one uh, public blockchains evolving from here? Um. A very good question. This is actually one of the motivations for for gateways. So, so um, when we looked at gateways, uh, we tried to understand. Like, so, first of all, why did we have TCP/IP to begin with? And for those who are interested, um, one of the the big names, you know, so one of my he the heroes of my, day, you know, there's Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn, and of course there's there's uh, Dave Clark at MIT. Dave Clark's got a nice new book, I think last year, or year before on. On the history of making the internet, but but the motivation back in the late sixties was the fact that the U United States communications, both uh, civilian and defense, was based on this connection-oriented telco model. So the theory was that you know in those days the Cold War, remember, the enemy could just whack, could just bomb you know a couple of phone major phone exchanges, and we won't have any communications right end to end. So so this whole routing model was developed, and. Um, in, in those, it, so so in in those days the, the there was you know the telcos was like one company right <laughs> they you know AT and T told us what the packet AT and T told us everything right fine that worked for a time now I, I you know this whole gateway model is trying to address the same problem that you have um, a proliferation of these uh, networks that essentially hold assets. Right, but then there's this problem of asset mobility and survivability. So another big event, I you know that I, that people I think sort of uh, gloss over was the CryptoKitties. So CryptoKitties placed uh, the Ethereum network almost at a standstill. It, it sort of halted, and this brought the question of survivability because back in the '60s, the reason why DARPA and and the army and so on placed so much investment in the internet was certain communication survivability so today do we have equivalent survivability if if tomorrow there was a day zero virus that crippled you know 90 percent of all the mining nodes or state you know uh, forging nodes staking nodes of a network my asset is stuck there i can't move it out right so how how, how do we how do we solve this problem because for you know, investors don't want to know about this. Investors just say, if I want to sell now, I expect that the business sold in the next five seconds. I don't want this business about well, gee whiz, we got a we got <laughs> you know blockchain uh, overload <laughs> and the transactions are very slow today. It's like it's it's not you know that's not acceptable for you know the today's sophisticated you know traders in Wall Street. Right. Right. Um and, and do you see uh, a proliferation of more layer one blockchains, more private blockchains? I mean, I guess you could say both, but do you think there'll be a consolidation? Uh, probably not so much among private blockchains because those I think would just continue to proliferate. But do you see a consolidation against layer one blockchains or do you think we have a, a long way to go still before we get to that point? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I'm... I'm uh, I, uh, I, so eventually, there needs to be consolidation, and there needs, I think, just just through just human beings have a limit to how much complexity our brains can handle, right? And at some point in time, we'll all say, okay, enough of all this, you know, different variations of of blockchains. Let, let's let's you know settle on like three or four, just a small number 
uh, with you know inbuilt functions that are relevant for you know certain types of transactions. And what will happen would I think is the, the same technology that's used in the public networks will just be adopted inside private networks. It's just easier because you know if you're an enterprise or you're a consortium and enterprises, you know you just want to buy software and run. Okay, you don't you don't you don't want your internal dedicated team to be doing software maintenance, you know, every week, uh, and then developing its own versions and forks, right? So, so at layer one, I think there'll be consolidation over time. The question is when, because you know, people are still so. There's this negative aspect, and audience can feel free to disagree with me. That there's this. Uh, aspect of speculative investments that's driving creation of yet different uh, blockchain networks, private networks for literally for the purpose of literally, you know, um, you know, what's the what's the polite word of, say, of saying this? You know, rising, uh, increasing the price of the you know uh, endogenous token of that network, right? So it's self-serving, right? And and that can only last. You know, for a while, right? You know, this particular network. So oh, the token's gone up price in thirty percent this week. Why? Because some other company decided to use that service, right? But then, what happens? You know, if if you repeat this multiple times, you know, we end up having a thousand different non-interoperable systems, right? And there's no incentive to work together because right now the goal of many of these, you know, um, private asset networks is to capture as much of the audience as possible. So it's it's not in the interest to do interoperability. Right. Right. I agree with that. So okay, so so moving uh moving forward, uh your your paper, uh actually it is a paper in draft, right? The interoperability architecture for uh, distributed ledger technology <clears throat> gateways. Um so I will include a link in the show notes, um but it is still uh it's still a work in progress, but uh it's largely written. I guess you're collecting feedback. <laughs> Uh, has there been a lot of feedback, or are you you contempl contemplating certain sections of it? Uh? Uh, yeah, so so a bit of background about about the the it's called an internet draft. So in the IETF, the the way you know standards are formed is through these drafts, and and then if there's a sufficient interest, a working group is created. And uh, the IETF, one of the reasons we went to the IETF is because it's an open uh, organization. So the idea is that, you know. What what things can we standardize today in terms of writing specifications? And the reason is because if you look at the traditional banking and I think even future banking, the um, there needs to be written specifications. It's, it's not enough for some industry verticals to just have a GitHub user guide and say, well, that's that's the RFC, that's the guide, right? You know, so the so the the ITF um, it, uh, sort of spec process is very um, you know rigorous, right? So the the drafts, you know, I've seen drafts, some of the you know drafts like for the OAuth uh, open authentication token, it, it went through like thirty two different iterations. So it's draft 001 all the way to zero zero thirty two, which which took about two years, three years, very contentious. And then it gets reviewed by everybody, and then it gets reviewed by the security experts, and then it gets you know. So there's multiple cycles of uh, reviews because often there's imprecision in language that confuses people. There's this other er there's errors, you know, literally, and there's sometimes there are components. For example, if you're doing a draft on a particular cipher, a cryptographic algorithm. Uh, you you have to specify every byte and every bit and every function, you know, down to the detail. There, there's no hand waving here, and it's and it's a printed document. And the goal is that if if this document is to be given to an engineer, that yeah, maybe is familiar with the area but's never done it before, that engineer needs to be able to implement. I would say seventy percent, eighty percent of the material in the RFC. And of course, there's always going to be twenty percent, twenty percent, thirty percent of questions like, "What does this mean? What does that mean?" Right. So this is, this is a normal engineering process, and this is how you have interop because then, you know, the 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 documents that that become RFC in the IETF, the authors have to surrender, not surrender. They have to give an IPR statement, basically saying, "Okay." We are willing to give anybody, maybe for example, ran non-discriminatory sort of access to our patents that are relevant to implement this draft because it benefits the whole industry that this particular RFC, a particular tech, you know specification, gets adopted. Because 
you know, pe people want value and value typically lies at the higher levels of the stack as you, you know eric um you know so for example you know in a in a movie streaming industry right they don't care about the tcp ip packet but it has to be there everybody in the in the network right. has to implement you know so the value goes up you know increasingly as you go up the stack and so you know um there's a dependency then. This is where this whole layered model becomes important. And I, I like the way people are using layer one, layer two, because I think we're going to end up with at least layer, you know, four layers. It is yeah. L3 and L4 that's yet to be discovered, discussed, argued, you know, fought about. For sure, for sure. Well, well, humans have a way of, of uh, making everything more complex over time with, with periods of consolidation. So um, back to the, to the gateways. Um, Let's define the the gateway construct a little bit in terms of, you know, its connection points. Obviously, so so just to introduce the concept a little bit more, um, you know, there, you know, we've covered bridging before on on the podcast. Uh, we had a uh, bridging across ten thousand blockchains with Jack Lu and Wei Zhang of Wanchain. That was a, a, a great episode. We learned a lot about uh, how bridging occurs. Gateways are are different. It's a different methodology, right? And so that's what we're going to be talking today about, which is that something else being the gateway. But just from an architectural perspective, um, in terms of moving assets, much in the way you do for bridging. How would you how would you describe uh, gateways, and how would you differentiate it from from bridging, just for the purposes of of you know better understanding? Sure, sure. So I actually listened to that podcast, Eric. That was that was a very good podcast. Uh, I learned uh, a lot actually. So so the the idea of the the bridge, uh, the sorry, the gateway uh, in the ITF comes from the the BG Border Gateway Protocol, which is also a gateway and you can buy actual routers that expensive routers that implement the BGP protocol. So the idea in a gateway is that uh, you have peers. So you have uh, one gateway that stands in front of one blockchain network or one DLT network. And you have another one, a second one that, that, you know, stands in front of, you know, the, uh, um, the second network. And of, of course, in each network, you can have multiple gateways and we can talk about how, you know, what, uh, strategies would you use to select, you know, a particular gateway and at any point in time, right? And and so the idea would be that when you do an asset transfer, right now in the ITF, we're just looking at unidirectional, right? And uh, if we if we cannot do unidirectional, we won't be able to use bidirectional or do all this fancy stuff like you know atomic hash lock. So just something very simple. The, the ITF always functions. Out. Let's do the simplest thing and and build from there. What's uh, define a building block. So here's the building block. Uh, so you have gateway G1 in front of blockchain B1. You have gateway G2 in front of blockchain blockchain B2. So G1 is peered with G2. So uh, we need a separate mechanism for uh, G1 to discover G2 that we can talk about that. So the idea would be that here's an asset that's in blockchain B1. It needs to be disabled or extinguished. So this is, you've, you've heard this phrase before, the, the burn and... Uh, What's the phrase? Uh, Mint and burn or lock or? Yeah, so you, you want to lock uh, uh, and eventually extinguish the asset, which has economic value, which is what makes it very complicated, and uh, move the value uh, to the second blockchain and recreate, regenerate the, the value in the second blockchain, assuming at the protocol and the packet uh, at the L1 layer, this is possible, right? It's, it's, it's quite conceivable it's not possible so for example if i have a land certificate for you know my my nice you know 100 acre property in the bahamas you know in blockchain b1 and i want to move it to blockchain b2 and b2 happens to be bitcoin well no there's packet incompatibility you can't do that right so so assuming it can assuming you can do that so we need a commitment protocol that is robust and we've been looking at the traditional a database commitment protocols, which is the two-phase commit protocol, and actually it's the better one is the three-phase commit protocol. So the reason why we're looking at that that particular protocol is because we want the traditional ACID properties, ACID, which is you want atomicity. Uh, so uh, while that unidirectional transfer is happening, uh, it, it, it can't be interfered. It, it needs to be uh, atomic. 
done or not done. There's no there's no half half finished. You know, finish uh, everything or not not finish at all. So it needs to be atomic. Uh, C it needs to leave both sides in a consistent state. So consistency. Uh, number three is uh, isolation. So so uh, while this is happening, uh, you know, you you can't you can't do double spending. Right. So, so this is, uh, and then um, D durability. Once it's done, it's done. There's no, there's no backing off. There's no rollback. Right. And so, if you if you made a mistake, yeah, you just send it back again. But but you, you can't undo a particular. Um, and so, so in distributed databases, this is the model that that um, has been used, particularly in in high speed transaction database systems that, in fact, underlie, if you go to Wall Street, look at all the networks and databases, this is the technology under the hood. They might not call it two-phase commit or three-phase commit, but you know um, that's that's the paradigm that they use. So we're using that between G1 and G2. And so there's a number of issues. So in, uh, you know, so, so, and we're trying to extract out some principle, design principles, just the way the internet has design principles. So. Um, for blockchain, the first blockchain B1, you know, we don't know what that particular consensus mechanism is going to be used in, in B1 or what packet data, data structure is going to be used. D does it allow locking? Does it support, uh, you know, escrow? We, we don't know, right? This is, this is the other problem that, that in order to be universal, uh, you know, we don't know, how, we cannot know in advance what B1 is going to be. So. The scope of work in the ITF is simply the the facing side B one G one and G two, right? And the design principle is that a G two does not need to know the interior constructions and designs and resources and addresses and what what have you of the other blockchain B one and vice vice versa. Just the way today, two routing domains they don't need to know the subnets and subnet IP addresses and the subnet writing pro of the other, you know, network. So you want to hide it. You want, I think in, in the draft, in the ITF draft, I think uh, we said um, opaqueness. What was the, the opaqueness principle, right? So, so and, and, and that is to promote scalability. The internet today scales beautifully because each network is opaque to the other. It only shares minimum information about routes through the BGP uh, routing product. That's the purpose of, of the BGP is to advertise that if you want to route to this particular domain in this side of the world, you can route it through me. And that that's all the that's all it does. It says route available. Right. Right. So this is back the roots of, of BGP. So this is what inspired the gateway, the gateway protocol. Uh, the second document that that actually defines what this protocol is, is called ODAP, which is a open digital asset uh, protocol. And it's, it, it defines a number of inter, you know, just relevant things like API endpoints. Uh, wh wh where's the URL for the endpoint to talk to the API at you know, Gateway G1 and G2 and so on. So all those details are being um, defined in this second document called uh, ODAP, ODAP. And is and would the gateway construction be dependent on ODAP? ODAP is, I mean, again, well, maybe just to even take a step back on what ODAP is, it's sort of the um, the standard uh, the standards for communication. You know, like I, you know, again, I come from Wall Street, you know, from Wall Street, and I think in terms of like fix, you know, and fix is sort of like the you know you have your technical commercial side, but you, the fix messaging structure is predetermined, you can turn on and off different fields. Is that similar to what that, ODAP that's a, is? That's exactly right. That's an excellent description. It's it's just defining some of the obvious and needed from an engineering perspective, uh, constructs like API endpoints, identifiers. What does that, what by, you know, is that, you know, is it, is it mycompany.com slash something, something, slash something, something. And, and yes, yeah, so we, in fact, in the group, um, uh, you know, we have a meeting every two weeks uh, that's that's attended by quite a few people. We talk about profiles of ODAP. So if if somebody wants to, as I said, use certain fields, tick tick the box on certain fields to make to implement ODAP for a particular instance, then we've been using using the word profile. So you could say, oh, I want to I want to build build a profile of ODAP where one side is a traditional you know, Swift banking network and the other side is a blockchain, 
great. <laughs> but, you know, you look at ODAP, you still need to, you know, specify in gory detail what are the, what are the you know, um, choices of, of, of the fields that you're going to use in ODAP. So, so let me ask a, a, a different question. I, I do want to return back to ODAP, but we 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 have some wood to chop on on the gateway too. So, um, but on on the on ODAP, uh, it, it is a standard. It's and, and so, can the gateways exist with other standards, or is is o, is ODAP uniquely suited to those gateways? In other words, let's say the Fix Protocol came in and said, "This is we love this gateway idea." We're gonna we're gonna create a fixed protocol for that, or we're also gonna talk maybe a little bit about Visa, which also seems like it's developing its own protocol. And they say, "Hmm, we love this gateway uh, idea, so we're gonna plug that. We're gonna plug our uh, protocol into that." Does you know? So is 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 ODAP more dependent on the gateway than the gateway is dependent on ODAP? Uh, so so the so I think what we what we're trying to do in ODAP is extract out those engineering details that will be needed anyway so if right, if, right that uh, you might call it this we're calling it we're calling it that but if you if you if you transcribe it on a piece of paper and we do the same uh, it's just a new url endpoint <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the it's those very minimal basic things that like we need to for example today if you are you know, developing a, a web service, right? Then you define API endpoints. You know, well, you know, we people don't argue about HTTP anymore or about URL URI. It's a given because it's 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 so you know minuscule, but but necessary. And so I'm hoping that um, personally, I'm hoping that the the ODAP sort of be, you know gains popularity, and we we like to invite people to come and you know to the ITF and participate and and tell us what's missing in ODAP. Right, because it's again, it's still a draft. It's it's you know, um, it's still a long way. I believe personally, uh, you know, maybe another year or two. There's knowing the ITF process, it does take that long, and you know, uh, which is also good because I think good engineering takes time, right? Um, it, it, let, let's do good engineering uh, and take the time and do it right, you know, uh, without having to go back and revisit. Because as you know, an audience may know, we, we went through this kerfuffle with the Wi-Fi. Remember the Wi-Fi security issue back in 2000, yeah. 2001? And that's because a lot of vendors jumped out, and, and I won't name names, producing, you know, Wi-Fi 802, you know, uh, was it 802.1.11, uh, um, the A and the G, what was it? The, yeah, 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 no. And, and, I, and, the, and the cipher, the encryption algorithm was weak, and people were bre breaking into people other people's Wi-Fi. And then, you know, they can they convoke this, Special IEEE task group TGI to just to design the cipher, and then what happened was, uh, you know, there was this discussion. Oh, well, we have to replace the hardware, we have to replace the firmware, and so it it sort of put sales of Wi-Fi devices on a standstill for like two years. No one was selling Wi-Fi hardware, and so I feel the same thing, right? That if we rush too much and discover there's you know errors, you know, your your private network that contains your assets, it, it might just Become unpopular, unworkable, and you'd have to reinvest and you know fix your code and so on, right? And so that's why written standards, you know, is important because people need to read and think about this. Running code mm -hmm. is, but don't get me wrong, ITF is about running code, right? So we love running code. You know, Kerberos is all about code. In fact, I, I, you could blame some of us at, that, at MIT for for going the opposite. We had the code first, and then we had to write the RFC. And so maybe what you're describing, and I'll, I'll pull a page from something you're familiar with, is like the way that we have like an ISO and an NIST and even CMMC in the cybersecurity community, different standards for achieving it. And when you're actually, um, a lot of times, if, if you're trying to support a particular standard, I mean, this is, you, the fields will be more definitional, but you'll do a reference to NIST and ISO and CMMC. You'll just connect all the two and nobody would say, oh, geez, it's a shame we only have, that we have so many and not just one. We've sort of operated saying, okay, well, NIST offers something different, a different nuance and ISO is a different certification standard. And over time, who knows, maybe it Maybe it coalesces or maybe it doesn't, yeah. but it's not really that critical that there be a single standard. I mean, now you have another standard coming along yeah. Yeah. and it just evolves and and it doesn't mean you like say, okay, we're immediately shredding the other one and starting with a new one. So in many ways, like, you know, to the extent the doc the the ODAP is is evolutionary, 
Um, there could be different standards. It, it, it sounds like what you're basically saying is there could be multiple standards. You might need to map the standards, like, right? If yes. you say, oh, well, we did our standard on ODAP and you did yours on the Visa standard and like, oh, well, which which fields are which and just sort of map it. But then once you've done that mapping exercise, you have two different standards or three different, st but you've mapped them. So, you know. That's right. That's right. Exactly right. So, so uh, there will be um, multiple standards for the multiple components. So, for example, Talk about bridges and the uh, and the UPC hub, right? The Universal Payment Hub. I mean, it's conceivable. That's you know, we we've spoken to the Visa guys uh, before, and they're they're very aware of the work in the ITF. I mean, it's quite possible that you use the IETF gateway construct between your network and the UPC hub on one side. Right. For the bridges that the Wan Chan was talking about, you could do the same thing, right? And I think, uh, and that's only you know the 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 two phase commit that's implemented by ODAP, that's only a small slice of what needs to be implemented. There's these other issues and that that I, I think I alluded to maybe a, a, um, maybe in the draft, th this regulatory and jurisdictional layers, right? This is, uh, this is, uh, this is what makes it complicated. So in, in the, in the IT, in the internet architecture, what you're trying to move is a set of bytes and packets and and the sender and the receiver maintain the contextual information at the edges and this is called this is a famous principle it's called the end to end principle that we take for granted today as being like blah obvious it wasn't P people had huge fights in the late 80s about this because there are people who were saying things like well we need to put the packet encryption inside the network right as part of the core network of the of the internet and people say well if that's the case that means the network needs to be aware of context. In this case, the security associations between the endpoints and the, and the keying material, which makes the whole internet design very, very complicated, right? And so, the luckily the the correct guys won the day. We said no, 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 keys encryption that's outside the internet design. And so, I, I hear you know people today complain about the internet is broken because it doesn't have identity. It doesn't have. It was designed. It wasn't broken. It was designed that way so that it could scale. It was intended that you're supposed to build your identity layer on top of it. And I think people are beginning to realize that we kind of need the same thing. If we want to have the internet of value for uh, assets and blockchains, you can't cram in everything into you know, one layer. You need to you need to figure out your layered architecture up and down and say which section goes where. And so one of those layers is going to be, uh, you know, AML. This is I, I've been calling it the AML layer. This is this is the stuff about um, tracking which entity holds the particular assets in an, and so who's the or in, in in terms of an asset movement across gateways, across networks. Who is the originator? who is the beneficiary? This is the FATF model, right? And right. the FATF model, FATF is the, help me, Eric, it's, 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 the, it's the- Financial it's Action uh, task, task Force. Force group. It's the people who deal with the problem of AML, have been dealing with you know anti money laundering and so on for like what is it twenty five years I think it's, yeah it's an yeah and there's like uh, was one hundred ninety countries or something represented and they they're right they, right they have they have offer guidance and standards and the jurisdictions have to adopt them and a blacklist from <laughs> jurisdictions which is you know, now now the advantage guys so this is so the gateway in its in its very basic form gateway to gateway is this ODAP and you could use it for a bridge you can use it for a UPC hub connection you can use it for many things. But uh, when you begin addressing specific use cases, then certain other layers have to come into play. So one of them would be this AML layer. So the um, question then becomes, so if, 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 I want, if I was a network here I had, and I had a gateway, and Eric, you're a net network in the Bahamas, and it has a gateway, and I want to move assets to your account uh, in your network through these two gateways, G1 and G2, the problem becomes, well, before you do that, uh, are you complying to local AML regulations in both countries, right? And the, the sort of the minimal, um, bare minimal, I would say, sort of agreement is is defined in the FATF recommendation 15 and 16. And I believe there's a few updates, you know, I think there's a recent update there. And that is that um, before or at the same time as the asset transferal, you have to also transfer information about the individuals the originator about me and you be you know that's doing this transaction right right now the question becomes in this particular use case 
who is operating the gateway. So if, if regardless of how the gateway is implemented, whether it's, it's a single server with a, you know expensive hardware and so on and so on, whether it's you know a VM up in Amazon AWS, doesn't doesn't matter who is responsible legally for operating that gateway. And this is called the VAS, the Virtual Asset Service Provider in FATF language, F, you know, V-A-S-P, kind of, you know, kind of pain to say VASP. <laughs> uh, but, but so the question then becomes, when these two gateways begin to open connection, you know, and then eventually, you know, implement, execute ODAP, before they even get to the ODAP stage, they need to find out who these guys are. So I'm a gateway here in, in Boston. Uh, I'm owned by this VASP, you know, number one, and, and the gateway in the Bahamas, where your network is, where your asset is, is owned by, you know, VASP no, number two. Who are the, who are these companies? Are they legally registered? Do have do, do they have an LEI number, right? And this is where this whole discussion about well, how can we autom automate this so that when G1 wants to talk to G2, he already knows within a split second they're, they're both legitimate um, registered businesses who own and operate it. Uh, it could even, if you wanted to, um, inquire about the technology that implements the gateway. This is about gateway attestations, which is another thread that that you know is being discussed in the IETF. Uh, and then once they they do that, they can open you know a secure channel. You know we're not defining what it is. You were just saying TLS is kind of your, your base secure channel, and then you can start talking about you know implementing ODAP and you know two-phase commit or three-phase commit, right? So so there's these layers. Things need to happen first at I think uh, at at the legal layer before we can actually move assets. And the reason is because when you're moving asset, you're unlike the internet, it's not just moving bytes, you're moving economic value, right? In and out of networks. And that can have indirect impact on the bigger economy, uh, on mainstream economy as as the economists, you know, at will tell you there's, there's many reports that talk about this um, problem that you know crypto is not just crypto it's not just by its actual you know you know economic value right right so so and just to kind of circle back <coughs> excuse me to um, that core distinction with bridging um, so so in a bridging context typically you know I, I don't you know, I, I often think of bridging as something you do to convert your asset to something else. And so that you put in something and you get a wrapped asset back and then you can transact. Um, but I suppose in terms of you're doing trade pairs and what have you, you can do it instantaneously through a bridge. It's, it's a similar process. A compliment. So, so I look at bridging as the next layer up. So if, if you have, you know, an entity, you know, providing bridge services, it in fact could implement the gateway function within its network, right? Because because the word bridging here, there's a connotation because it's it's not just moving, uh, you're, you're converting. So, so let's say blockchain B1 was currency one and blockchain B2 was currency two. Somebody who's running a bridging network would say, we have our own temporary local token or currency, you know, call it currency three. And what we do is go from one to three and three to two. Right. Right. And so great. That's one solution you could pursue, but underneath there, you still need this two phase. You, you need commitment, right? When when you move this inside in the bowels of your network, you will need those four properties, ACID properties, for your own security, right? Because if suddenly your network gets hacked and um, your your conversions are interrupted, right? So in fact, you could even say, well, maybe there's two cases of um, commitment that's needed. So from currency C1 to currency C3, that has to happen atomically. And then from C3 down to C3, C2, the second blockchain. So yeah, to me, this is a great compliment that in fact, the whole bridging concept is a richer uh, sort of construct that wraps around the gateways. In fact, one or more gateways will be needed that implements this ODAP commitment uh, sort of unit unidirectional, right? So you could have, you know, you could implement a bridge that is bidirectional. Right. It's, it's just it's just more of the same stuff. The little units inside the ODAP instantiations. Yeah. So so it's interesting. When I was reading the paper, it occurred to me that it you still you, you know you, rem, you you know you could potentially over time remove some of the third party intermediation, but you're still going to have to have certain components 
maintained by third parties, irrespective. Like whether yeah, yeah, it's a security it, layer, you know, that's or, right, or, that's or right. yeah. and and it could be it could be that in the future there will be many of these bridging networks, and that your gate is all if if you're a private network, you know, you're a consortium of of enterprises, your gateway could have an additional function that just scans through the the cost of conversion, just, just like today, right? When you buy you buy and sell U.S. dollars, right? You you know which which particular exchange service bridging service gives you the best value today, right? So right. Could, could, could you automatically choose, say, okay, I'm, I'm going to send, you know, a hundred million you know, dollars to Eric in the Bahamas. I could, I could help use, you know, something like, you know, Wan Chan uh, chain today, you know, maybe somebody else tomorrow. Why? Well, because something's the price of the, uh, you know, conversion fee has slightly gone up. Right. And that needs to be automated. Then in the future, these, these transfer gates, which is just, Pick the cheapest route, just just the right. way, just the way the internet today, when it picks, you know, routing, it picks the the best route, and the best is is not the the perfect. It's the uh, what's the what's the phrase there? The um, uh, best uh, uh, best grade. What's the phrase? I'm I'm blanking out, Eric. It's it, it's it's the the most optimal route for this particular context. Okay, right. So it, it could be. The same thing, right? Uh, so I'm going to write by this particular bridge or that bridge because it's optimal. You know, the fees are better for me today if I use bridge, you know, bridge number two or bridge number three. Right, and and I also suppose that this kind of construct, like let's just take Swift for example, where you have a network, it has to be enterprise grade. Maybe they don't want to rely on public, you know, public blockchain type resources. They effectively want to build. Maybe a more of a closed network, a membership-based network. Um, presumably, they could use this as a building block to facilitate that the, that kind of uh, fully enclosed system, right? And, and that, not have it, to. It, yeah. That's right. Exactly right. So, so the in the draft, we even say, well, you know, the, so there's two principles, right? So the principle, the first one is opaqueness, you know, uh, uh, principle, uh, and second one is is that ODAP needs to be oblivious to the economic value. At the ODAP layer, it's just bits and bytes. That's it. It, does, it doesn't know anything. It's, it shouldn't know anything about the economic value. That's that's at the bridge layer or or some other layer above it, right? So um, in the in the in the case of of you know something like you know Swift, you know, uh, you would like to be able to have one side literally be a traditional banking. Maybe it's Swift on one side, right? On the other side, it's any number of available blockchains today. And so when an engineer in this, you know, Swift engineer sits down and says, oh, how do we do this? This, this is where the ODAP choices, as you said, like which, which options fields are we going to use in ODAP for this particular scenario? Because one side, we've got this banking network and it doesn't know anything about consensus. It doesn't know what a hash lock is. It doesn't know what a time lock is. It doesn't know all this fancy stuff. In fact, it doesn't even <laughs> probably use, you know, um, elliptic curve cryptography. It's probably still using RSA, you know. So, oh, no. so that's the choice, that. right? One side, and then you, and then the engineer has to go to the right side. Okay, well, you know, who are we talking on the on the blockchain side? On that's on the on the second side. Well, you know, maybe it's Ethereum. Great. Well, we have these tools available when we talk to Ethereum. But then you say, well. Uh, actually, it's uh, instead of Ethereum, maybe it's an instance of Fabric. Well, it's got a different construct there, right? And so, so the 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 common sort of context in this, you know, in this uh, gateway is this ODAP. But it's ODAP on its own is insufficient. You need all this other stuff that addresses the particular connection scenario or use case. Right, right, and and so now just to get back to. Um, the, the, the FATF point that you were talking about, do you see, I mean, for that reason, for, you know, for what I described, like a SWIFT network or some other uh, financial intermediary or VASP type network, do you do you see that that this particular construct is going to be more appealing, you know, in terms of AML compliance than, than possibly other networks where maybe you know it, it, the AML compliance is you know it, it's a third party protocol or something but you're talking about like enterprise grade level vasps yeah. and, and and such is is that is that where you see probably the the primary use case so so the question of of um 
so this is so AML and uh, so fat of AML, the travel rule, it's all about data, particularly person data, individual data, originated data, beneficiary data, and of course, VASP data, uh, you know, business data, right? And so in a sense, it's it's disconnected. It's a separate layer. It's probably two layers up from uh, this, um, the, what I call the gateway, you know, layer. And so the challenge in the FATF uh, situation is that uh, uh, both sides, VASPs now have the responsibility of making sure that the originator data, personal data is accurate, and um, the same on the on the beneficiary side. And the problem is that um, these VASPs need to actually send personal data. So if if I was going to send you, you know, you know, assets in the Bahamas, Eric, my VASP in Boston actually will have to se send to your VASP in the Bahamas my first name, last name, address, account number here in Boston. Uh, I think probably email address or phone number. Right, so so that's great, but I don't know as an individual, as a citizen, I don't know what data privacy regimes or regulations are being implemented in the Bahamas by the VASP. Because the last thing I want is my personal data to be sold off to data aggregators that's you know quite common today, and, and vice versa, right? And so there's this problem, and, and so, uh, we gave a presentation at, at FATF in 2019 in the Vienna meeting just before recommendation 15 was was produced. And we kind of suggested that, you know, maybe these VASPs need to get together and form their own network uh, that's off chain, that has nothing to do with blockchains, you know, directly for the purpose of exchanging uh, customer personal data securely uh, and observing some common maybe global private data privacy rules you know, such as the gdpr right so that so a, a vasp as a as a business it needs to be registered of course needs an lei number and then when it joins it net, this network it needs to sign you know a contract and a membership agreement saying that if i receive personal data from people in you know you know in belonging to people or customers of other VASPs in that community, I promise not to be leaking that out and, se and selling it to, to marketing companies, right? Um, because, you know, you, you know, Eric, I, you know, if I send you, you know, uh, you know, a hundred million dollars, you know, today, ne next, you know, next, next day, I'll get all these junk emails from, you know, uh, luxury car manufacturers trying to sell me cars, right? <laughs> like, how do they know, right? So this is, so, 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 so that's one side, and of course, this is all about anti-money laundering, right? And so that network needs to be visible to the government so that the government can enforce whatever AML regulations they need to enforce, right? So people talk about, well, let's use zero knowledge proofs for this, you know, personal data networks uh, amongst the vast. That's great, you know, use whatever, whatever you want for data privacy and privacy preservation, but don't forget that the government is in there as a partner and they need the capability to figure out, you know, entities who are buying and selling or, you know, sending assets for the for the purpose of anti-money laundering regulations. Right. And I suppose there could be a way even I, I think one of the things that's talked about is like, how do we get to the least used, uh, you know, uh, scenario where you don't provide access to, to, to more than you absolutely need to? And I think maybe that's where like ZKP or, or, you know, I suppose you can even design it as a fully homomorphically encrypted uh, network. Um, although, you know, it, it could be SMPC, you know, there's all the, uh, you know, homomorphic encryption is still as a way to go, uh, you know, in terms of scalability, but, um, you know, whereby the, the individual VASPs may not need to collect all that data. They just may need to know that that data has been collected by a credible source and, and, you know, but the, and, and that it exists. And then presumably the government authorities or somebody right. else could also access it if they needed to, but just to limit, you know, because in a lot of cases on, on the regulatory side, you know, uh, regulators are, are used to collecting just reams of data, you know, enormous amounts of data and, and can, you know, sharing it with all these different algorithms and et cetera to conduct, you know, surveillance. But ultimately, you know, to the extent that those, that that information is available or represents a honeypot, 
then, you know, then, then great. You know, the regulators have it, but the bad news is that, you know, any individual regulator might be just insecure, you know, right, and, right. and, and, <laughs> you know, all you need to do is figure out which one is, is the weak one and you get all that data. Whereas if it's like, you know, I, I often think in terms of like a red flag, like if something's flagged, then, okay, then that's the, the basis upon which you, you collect the data. But in the absence of a red flag, you know, you're 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 conducting your testing and everything else in a fully homomorphically encrypted fashion or an encrypted fashion, and not not necessarily That's revealing right. it or subjecting that That's vulnerability. Right. So That's right. Um, so this is another frontier, exciting frontier. So our, our group, Connection Science, is um, helping with a group called TRISA, Travel Rule Information Sharing Alliance. If you people just T R I S A, and you'll see the website. So the the goal of TRISA is in fact to look at this new infrastructure to, to support the sharing of this personal information among VASPs, right? So it's open to, you know, any and all kind of privacy preserving, uh, you know, technologies. And we've had presentations and people talking about zero knowledge proofs and people talking about just straight encryption. But, but I think uh, right now, the VASP community exchanges, they need to realize that they need to get together and form this Data network, uh, data exchange network on their own, and and you know provide some maybe even standards there, uh, so that you know like which fields are going to be sent, you know, and you can even you know grade you know endpoints, countries, you know, oh well, you know this asset is going to be a, a, a customer has asked for a thousand dollars to be sent to this remote, you know, you know. Um, country over there in some other continent um, and we don't think it's secure enough. So we're going to tell the customer, you know what, if, if we sell this, send this thousand dollars, which is permitted under, you know, under SEC regulations, we still have to send your personal data. Are you willing to go ahead? Right. So, so the customer, the individuals need to uh, be aided, help by the tools in understanding that, you know, sending crypto is not just sending crypto. There's other, implications such as well possibly your personal data could be also sent to this remote place and after it's get it gets there we don't know what's going to happen right so 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 that's an exciting um also um frontier uh and i invite folks to look at you know trissa the, you know and this is this is you know part, part of a bigger um dialogue with some of the big um exchange networks um, one of the things I noticed in the paper, it talked about the importance of 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 log data in terms of verification. Um, you know, and 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 that's that was interesting to me only because I, you know, when you think in terms of bridging and and such, you're thinking, you know, you're basically looking to the blockchain, the immutable blockchain for a lot of these things. Which is not to say that you wouldn't also review the logs. Do you feel that the that you know? Collecting and retaining and analyzing the log data is of greater importance in this kind of network. Sure. So, so in the um, gateway draft in the document, um, there's this question of crash recovery, right? So, so uh, if you if if G1 and G2 are communicating uh, today's practices in in database, you know, um, consistency management, particularly distributed database uh, transaction oriented, you know, protocols. Uh, the, the the gateways, the databases uh, retain local logs. And the reason is that if the machine dies or crashes, it doesn't have to restart uh, the session from the beginning again. It can just say, look at its own, own local log, presumably it's on disk. Presumably there's a disk that survives the crash. Boots up, reads like, oh yeah, I'm you know out of the 11 steps, I was up to step five. And so I don't have to repeat step one to four, I can resume the previous session. So that's in the in the ODAP case. Uh, when we say log, we mean crash recovery log locally. And we've talked about well, should we should we record the log inside you know a blockchain or DLT? Yes, we could. But what you know what does it give us? Because for fast you know reboot and recovery and session resumption, you need the logs to be available either in memory or in disk. Worst case is on disk. Right. So, so, so it, it sounds like the log, uh, the log retention is probably really no different than like a, the, the way that a node operator would retain yeah. logs similarly. Okay. So, yeah. and, and you wouldn't, you know, and, and so you wouldn't place any lesser or greater importance by virtue of the fact that you're using a gateway versus using a sort of a, a public bridging network. 
uh, on uh, logs. I, I, I think the gateway is, is the protocol that implements the bridging. Right. right. The bridging is a higher layer, layer concept because it, in, but it includes this notion of value. And that's this notion of economic value is outside the scope of the ITF work. We, we said, you know, I've got a bunch of slides to say, okay. And in fact, the principles of uh, opaqueness and, you know, this end to end, you know, context says, well, the, the two gateways are not aware of any currency, any value whatsoever. Right. So, uh, I think it's a great um, complement to bridging, and you know we're looking at the idea. Well, if you have a bridge end to end, how many gateway pairs do you need under uh, in the hood and underneath the hood in, inside inside your your bowels of your of your bridge network that looks like so from the outside a good bridge looks like a simple straight uniform connection. Right, but underneath you say, well, okay, maybe there's you know two pairs or three pairs of gateways and that's we're kind of there at the at the minuscule sort of layer there just just between two gateways the gateway is a way of facilitating the bridging a way of standardizing that's the, right the, the 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 bridging but it's not like in lieu of it is no no it's not i do hope that the bridging community sort of begins to look at the need to standardize the endpoints right and and the actual bytes going across the bridges right so Great. and if there is a third currency involved you know you know that's mediating the exchange well then you know you need to also define the bytes that that reference that currency great great um and and do you see um with gateways there being any sort of limitations in terms of uh you know cryptography there's uh, new technologies such as using TEE, secure enclaves, you know, things like, you know, SGX. Uh, we're also very involved in the CCC, the Confidential Computing uh, Consortium, which is an alliance of people who are using some of this TEE uh, technology to create you know, the future secure computing, secure computation environment, right? And that that has a lot of challenges, but it's a great sort of, you know, we, we've looked at, well, you know, could we use TEEs to implement gateways, right? That's, right. right. Why not? You know, uh, in my gateway here and your gateway in the Bahamas, we could all, you know, implement TEEs and then it, it you know, it could talk to each other using that kind of trusted hardware. Right? So this is another, you know, exciting frontier, at least for me. <laughs> As I said, this is a, you know, I hope the audience appreciates that we're living in very, um, it's an exciting times, Ruby. Uh, yeah, you know, this is this is the next. This is truly the next sort of iteration of the internet. Yeah, and and I think even more exciting. But um, so 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 then in that context, you know, we mentioned a couple of different uh, you know forms of cryptology and, and frameworks. So which, so obviously TEE would be on the top of the list. Which other ones do you think would would be well suited? And you don't have to. You, I won't hold you to, to to this answer forever. <laughs> you know, if it changes in six months, it'd be like, well, that was six months ago. So you're, you're so so that's an interesting question because I think as an industry as a whole, and I'm talking about the the, the big players that you know who who particularly people who provide cloud services. So for cloud providers, TEEs offer an interesting technology because now they can create farms of servers uh, where each server hardware supports TEEs and uh, as a as a as a sort of grid of these TEE boxes you can essentially expose uh, you know trusted computing space to the end user the customer right and so um, it's it's early days and I think you've seen probably out there in the market maybe Intel SGX 2 whatever the version is now two point something it's kind of most popular um, primarily because I think it comes with the high-end um, Intel processors, right? And you do not have to buy any special processor, but, and there's several competitions as you know, out there, ARM's got a solution, AMD's got a solution. Uh, I think for the industry as a whole, uh, they will need to standardize on certain aspects of proving or attesting that your hardware is a true TEE. So, because if if you're so, here's a, here's a good example. So, if I was, if I was a biomedical service provider and I have you know very sensitive data, can, cancer data, 
for you know the the politicians in Washington D.C. Right? It's like, oh, who's got cancer? Right? This is this is very very you know, and so I would like to be able to compute or do data manipulation in a trustworthy space. But before uh, I load my data into your cloud that claims to have this technology, you need cloud provider, you need to be able to give an attestation back to me about the construction, literally the composition of your stack from hardware, firmware, all the way up to the uh, VMs uh, and the um, containers that are going to be running inside this execution environment. So we're at the cusp of a of, of fairly complex um, technology out there, right? It's, it's one thing to say something about a tech, you know, your infrastructure. It's another thing to be able to prove it sufficiently. Right. Right. And this is another ad. We've been active in Trusted Computing Group for like, what are it, 20 something years now, 21 years. Uh, and the ITF uh, of all places actually also has a group called, uh, a working group called RATS, Remote Attestation Working Group. That's pretty much the same bunch of guys from the TCG. But it's the ITF, so it's an open process. Uh, I invite people to to uh, read that. In fact, the, the just last week, I think the the group just voted the Rats architecture to be an RFC proper. So it's going to be, uh, and it's taken a year and a half, two years to get to this agreement on this architecture only because it is fairly complex. And I think there's a lot of synergy between. RAS architecture, TCG, you know, secure computing architecture with the whole crypto space. Because we see that in the future, it could be that crypto transactions need to be made private, right? But you need a way to prove, say, to the government that, yes, this transaction occurred in this infrastructure at this particular point in time. Here's a copy of the attestation that I received from the infrastructure provider cloud provider and here's my side of the evidence that I loaded up you know my side of the transaction to that particular TE and, and vice versa right so again fairly fairly complex fairly interesting and exciting right so so and and just to kind of summarize as, as I understand it you know you know presumably any type of encrypted framework, whether it's homomorphic or secure multi-party, may make sense in sort of a, a non-standardized, wider adoption context, a smaller closed network, you could do whatever, right? Uh, but but if you're thinking in terms of how do we do something that's going to be more universal, that's going to be more widely adopted, TEE would be you know sort of where you'd go first with remote attestations as opposed to, I mean, homomorphic encryption, it has to be, it all has to be largely right, closed. Right. That's, right? that's right. And, and in fact, this is another role for the gateway is that imagine you know blockchain b1 uh, all the nodes there you know it, it is a thousand nodes you know doing consensus and they're implementing some te mechanism in hardware so you you can't see you know people from outside can't see the the ledger the ledger is always perpetually encrypted but you want to move assets out of that network right so so this gateway needs to looking in it needs to participate in this whole private computing space so that it can know that there's no double, you know, same rules, no double spending, members can't cheat, all that stuff. So it needs to be able to peer into that encrypted space and then at the same time be able to talk to the outside world and move assets across, again, with the same acid, acid properties, the atomicity properties, right? And this is this is why we, the more we look at it, the more we sort of think, well, you know, this gateway construct is sort of the the smallest unit. It's it's literally the, you know, router to router connection above which you can build all sorts of fun stuff. But it needs to have this unit down there. So this is point of great you know, great aspect of this gateway is this whole, you know, private blockchain and crypto blockchain sort of you know. Uh, I, I think it's an upcoming area that's being studied by a lot of people. Right, right. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, it, it really sort of, you know, it, I think it's helpful to look at the gateways as sort of functioning within both in sort of a larger, broader universal context, as well as even integration with, with individual private networks that might have different crypto, you know, cryptographic properties. Looking at the, the, the Visa uh, universal payment channel hub under development, um, could you 
offer some, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you've, oh, I'm sure you've read the paper. You said you spoke to them. What are your thoughts on that and, and, and how, it, how would you would compare and contrast it with some of the work that, that you've been working on? Like the bridging concept, this is a, a great um, complement. So, so uh, my understanding of the of the hub model is that, in, in fact, it is going to be an, a hub and spoke, you know, model, and the and the hub could be something that Visa could run as a service, right? And so we see, you know, let's say you have blockchain B one that needs to talk to blockchain B two via this hub. Well, between each of the blockchain and the hub, you would run a gateway protocol such as ODAP. Right, so underneath, of course, is all the bells and whistles and all the features that are non-relevant and meaningful to the hub. Uh, and on a on a business sort of strategy, I think that's a very smart strategy on the part of Visa, because again, you know, right now the card payments industry is the industry that interfaces to the end user. Right, Mo most of us, particularly in developing countries, would be using some kind of a card, and of course, there's. Now on your on your phones you have NFCs and so on um, uh, near field communications, um, you know chips that allow you know your credit card to be stored right. You can just shop using your phone right. So, so um, for entities who are particularly Visa, Mastercard, and so on who are running card payment rails, essentially the challenge is what would be their role in the future in this whole sort of um, decentralized you know, digital currency space, can they repurpose their rails? Because they have a, they've built the rails. And what I mean by rails is the, the network that communicates transaction data from the, ish, the point of service terminal uh, up to the uh, uh, merchant uh, bank all the way to the issuing bank. So there's this parallel network you know, that, that, in fact, just, just delivers Transaction data. You know, Thomas went to, you know, Stop and Shop or you know, Seven Eleven, and you know, spent twenty dollars. Well, that that gets routed all the way to my issuing bank. Let's say I was a member of, you know, card member, cardholder of Bank of America issued cards. So, so that network already exists. So the question for these people, uh, this consortium of companies who own and operate this, what I, essentially is a data network, how can they leverage that? into this new world of digital currency and tokens and stable coins. And I think the hub model makes sense for, for people in that space as, as a possible future model, because, because today they are a kind of a hub and spoke, right? The, the merchants uh, online and, and the real world, you know, their point of service terminal, they talk to a, to a hub. Right. Already, right? So it's it's just it's just a, a transferal of the same hub and spoke model, but into the blockchain space. Right, um, and I suppose that that even the adoption of such a hub and spoke model, the UPC, is probably a bit of a threat to the to the banking. Yeah, yeah it's so so we we like to say, and we've, I've said it, you know, se several times, you know, publicly. I mean, banks are in the business of trust, right? That's what they do. I mean, yeah, they happen to be holding these bits and pieces, bytes and bits that's called money that I access through my, you know, ATM card and my ATM card can produce pieces of paper that's called, you know, money. But the majority of my transactions are card, right? So, so but I trust that brand. And I think the role for banks in this space is, in fact, to provide trustworthy services, regardless of how the assets or currencies are transferred, whether it's point to point, you know, maybe it's using some kind of a SWIFT, is it payment rails, or maybe it's a blockchain, right? So it's it's conceivable that you could replace the SWIFT network with an advanced sort of blockchain based network that that does the same thing plus plus other stuff, right? That, right. that instead of just sending transaction data, maybe it could also be running its own settlement coin, local coin, a token, so that all the banks can settle very quickly. So that so that the this you know, people who are familiar with the four corners model of the card payments, that the merchant bank and the issuing bank could settle literally in seconds versus having to wait overnight. I think which is what happens today, right? So there's a lot of improvements in speed. And at the same time, I mean, the goal is really to reduce costs to the merchants and to the consumers, right? So, so I think, I think no, we, by, uh, banks are going to be around, I think, a long time. It's just that they might be doing things different 
than what they do, you know, traditionally. Yeah. For sure, for sure. And and do you think, um, like, what do you think are some of the the biggest challenges to whether it's the UPC model or the gateway model? Like, do you believe that scalability, like the the standardization? Obviously, facilitates scalability, but where do you see the choke points, uh, you know, along the road? Hmm. Or yes, trade-offs. I, yeah. So, so, so definitely scalability of, of service. Um, another one that gets rarely discussed is um, what is the value to the main street economy? So, so, so the CBDC discussion, particularly for commercial banks, so for the wholesale CBDC space. Okay, you can, you can improve you know speeds and optimize and so on because it's all commercial banks right and it might provide them with you know gains but for main for retail cbdc you know uh, for you know mom and pop you know, people like you and me does this technology provide advantages over the card payments infrastructure so there needs you know if there's no advantage to the end user and there's no uh, improvement in the user interaction and user behavior using payments if i if i still go to stop and shop or 7-eleven and swipe my phone you know on top of the you know post terminal well th there's no change for me i mean in fact I, I, it's almost like i'm oblivious to whatever happens in the in the back right what i do care is is as a consumer is that well you know uh, my you know apr percentage you know penalties for late payments is lower if I use this new kind of technology, right? So things like that matter. So that that's a second, you know, challenge. And I think, um, you know, probably thirdly is this um, separation of standardization from, you know, incentivization. So so let me let me. This is an earlier point I mentioned that that um, a lot of speculative, you know, investors are, um, you know, jumping on these technologies just for speculative investment, which is great. Right, but then at the same time, I think and not enough resources, financing, and so on are being directed at standardization, which benefits everyone. So again, back in the internet days, um, DARPA, you know, funded the start of the internet to you know in today's money several hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Um, and but they, they have a particular they had a particular threat in those days. The world had a threat, and that was the Cold War, and that was driving it. Today, we don't really have a threat other than certain big nations in the uh, Asia Pacific, you know, region, you know, challenging the dominance of the US dollar. Okay, so as a so that that could be perceived as a threat that warrants all this investment is in this new technology, but I haven't seen that urgency. Right. Right. People like, oh, you know, in fact, in certain communities, particularly engineering communities, there's a, almost a um, cynical view on on crypto and blockchains and so on because they all say well it's you know so far it's just for speculation and there's no imminent danger uh, of the world collapsing that we have to like pay attention to this technology right right well i i think in the cbdc front but yeah the the us tends to um move a lot slow more slowly uh because of the democratic process and also the politicization politicization of it so um well, great. This has been a great discussion. I feel like we could go on, um, <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for for coming on the podcast. It was it was excellent to have you and and hear your insight. And we'll include the uh, sites of the papers in the show notes as well. Thank you so much, Eric. Yes, we could talk all day. This is getting an exciting time. I hope the listeners, audience at home realize yes, you know, get involved. You know, read stuff because this is going to impact your children, your your grandchildren. So you know, and again, technologically for me, this is an, an awesome time to be you know to be alive. Yeah, same here, same here. Well, thank you so much.